Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the GigaSpace's Dynamically Scalable E-Commerce Webinar. The webinar will begin shortly. We're just waiting for all the participants to join. Your patience is appreciated. While we wait for additional participants and just to fill the time, a few brief words about GigaSpaces. GigaSpaces Technologies is a leading provider of next generation application platforms, providing end-to-end -end scaling solutions for distributed mission critical application environments and cloud onboarding technology. GigaSpaces is the industry's only solution for end-to-end -end scaling in a single platform. Hundreds of enterprises worldwide leverage GigaSpaces technology to enhance IT efficiency and performance, as well as reduce costs, including Fortune Global 500 companies across, across industries, such as online gaming providers, telecom carriers, top financial service enterprises, through leading e-commerce companies, which will also be the focus of our webinar today. All of us, the solutions we provide for enterprises are also provided for easy onboarding of mission-critical apps to the cloud where we have premier partners in this space helping us achieve this goal. At this time, I'd like to present our host for this webinar, Ron Anderson. Ron Anderson is the Director of Architecture at GigaSpaces. Ron has over 20 years' experience designing and implementing mission-critical systems in some of the most demanding environments. Ron's background includes diverse middleware platforms such as Tuxedo, WebLogic, and now the GigaSpaces Extreme Application Platform. Joining Ron will be special guest panelist Jason Abate. Jason is the founder and CEO of Panopta, which provides real-time monitoring of websites and other infrastructure for thousands of companies around the world. Prior to founding Panopta, Jason spent 10 years in the hosting and IT infrastructure industry, where he's, he was responsibility. Our agenda for this webinar, Jason Abate will begin with an introduction to the e-commerce domain's challenges, then Ron will walk you through the dynamically scalable e-commerce architecture and will present a top American retailer's case study, and then we will open up the session to some questions and answers. To just a quick introduction of GigaSpaces in the e-commerce domain, GigaSpaces has been able to leverage our experience in some of the world's most demanding systems to address the unique challenges in the retail industry. With our end-to-end -end application platform, we have proven the ability to provide high-performance, highly available, elastic scaling capabilities to many of the world's leading retail organizations. So without further ado, I would like to now welcome Jason, who will be starting off the webinar. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. It's it's uh, uh, great to be here and, and share some of the ideas and, and things that we've discovered, and uh, hopefully give uh, some useful information for all the, the people that are listening uh, to help with their e-commerce sites. Uh, first, just to start off, just a little bit about uh, Panopta. Panopta is a an internet infrastructure monitoring service. Uh, basically, we monitor uh, websites, email servers, and network devices for thousands of customers around the world, and really our our goal is to uh, be their eyes and ears and, and let them know as soon as uh, their servers are having any problems so that they can, they can resolve those and, and fix them as, as soon as possible. And three of the main things that, that really differentiate the, the service that we do uh, from some, uh, some of our competitors, uh, first of all, we, we really have focused a lot on doing deep and wide monitoring. So we can monitor very complex infrastructures, um, all of the the modern web applications, websites, e-commerce sites, and things um, are are evolving to have a much more complex setup. There's a lot of, of uh, pieces uh, that, that go with that. There's a lot of, of moving parts. Uh, so we can monitor all of those pieces and make sure that we have a complete view of, of all of our customers' infrastructure. And we do this with a, a monitoring network of 25 locations around the world so we can, we can uh, monitor and measure how uh, sites are performing from uh, all these different locations and give you a, both a geographical view as well as the, the detailed technical view. Um, we also focus a lot on uh, eliminating any false alerts from our system. So we do uh, a high level, uh, high frequency checks and have a lot of algorithms in place to ensure accuracy. Uh, we've discovered both uh, from our own experience and with our customers that the, the quickest way to, uh, to, to really 
cut down the effectiveness of a monitoring system is to be triggering false alerts uh, that quickly you know, start to get ignored and then you miss real problems. And then finally, the other thing that we, we do a uh, heavy focus on is intelligent alerting so we can let our customers know via SMS, text messages, voice calls, uh, email, and things like that uh, whenever there are problems with their site. Um, so one of the things that, that we've done now uh, for a couple of years is what we call the Holiday E-Commerce Availability Index. Uh, and basically, this is a, a research study that, that we perform uh, monitoring a lot of the top e-commerce sites throughout the holiday season. Um, obviously, the you know, online shopping is, is getting to be a bigger and bigger piece of all of the, the holiday sales. Um, just a, a few things. Uh, this year, Forrester predicted in the U.S. alone $60 billion in sales. Uh, also, some other uh, studies have suggested up to 90% of all the, the consumers in the U.S. that uh, are doing holiday shopping do at least some uh, component of that online. So it's, it's clearly becoming huge, uh, a huge factor. And from a, an IT perspective, it, it's, it's challenging not only because of the, 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 what's on the line with the shopping season, but it also uh, brings in strong spikes in traffic. So you have days like Black Friday and Cyber Monday where you see huge surges in traffic that you really have to be prepared to, to handle. Um, and, you know, obviously there, there's a huge risk here, um, not only both from the immediate loss sales if your website has problems, if it goes down, if it's responding slowly, um, but we're now seeing more and more uh, of an impact in terms of angering customers or, you know, uh, driving them to competitors, which not only uh, cost the, the immediate sale, but also risks uh, future sales just from the, 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 uh, the image that's, that's put in place for your brand. So. Um, obviously, keeping your site up is, is, is hugely important through this period of the year. Um, so this year for the, the Holiday Index, we monitored 132 of the major uh, e-commerce sites uh, throughout the entire holiday season. So we started uh, on November 11th and, and ran all the way through uh, through the new year to January 2nd of this year and uh, measured the, the availability and the response times for all of these sites um, every 60 seconds. So for each site, we did uh, a little over 76,000 checks uh, for each site. Um, just to give a, a high-level overview of, of how everyone did, uh, so of the 132 sites that we monitored, um, only 50 of those made it through that entire six or seven week period with no downtime. Um, so you see here some of the, the logos of some of these, uh, you know, a lot of the big sites, Amazon, Apple, uh, Kohl's, Macy's, Target. Uh, so, that, you know, these sites did quite well. But the other uh, 82 sites, you know, things didn't go nearly as well. Uh, for these these sites, um, altogether we tracked nearly nine days of total downtime across all these sites, uh, so an average of 153 minutes per site, which is, is fairly substantial. Um, in, in doing this, we also tracked uh, almost 1,250 separate outages uh, for these sites. Um, so that, that's a lot of times where, you know, a site was was having problems, uh, and that's going to translate to, to lost sales. And, and even worse, the 12 worst sites that we tracked um, all had more than six hours of downtime apiece throughout this period. So that's you know definitely taking a, a substantial hit to their uh, their sales revenue for the year. Um, so next, we're going to drill into uh, just you know look a little more closely at, at one of these sites to see um, you know what their behavior was and what types of problems we think they ran into. Um, so uh, Brookstone uh, had uh, uh, actually most of the, the season they did relatively well, but they had some substantial downtime um, on starting on Cyber Monday. So over a period of about 14 hours, um, we tracked 97 separate outages uh, for their site. And these ranged anywhere from you know, a single minute outage to the longest of about 29 minutes. Uh, but over that period of time, they had uh, 552 total minutes of downtime, um, so that's you know that's roughly you know at least a quarter of the, the time for that that uh, that period um, their their site was actually down. Um, and and at the bottom of this this slide, you can see this is a, a timeline graph of the the measurements that we were taking. Um, so the the red line is showing the actual uh, the time to load their website uh, at each minute of the, the day throughout this. This is actually a one a one week view for their site. Um, the, the green horizontal line is the average response time for uh, 
the, the entire month of, of November. And then the, the orange bars are showing all the, the periods where we saw an outage. Uh, so a, a few things you can see here. Obviously, um, you know, the, if their site's performing well, there shouldn't be any orange on this, this graph at all. There's, there's a, a fair amount that we're seeing here. And then also during that period of time on the, the 28th and the 29th, um, the, the response times for their website shot you know, way up. They're, they're you know, six or seven times um, higher than the, the normal. Uh, so what we can kind of determine from this, um, both with the response times and the fact that they had a, a, a large number of relatively short outages, is their system was probably having trouble just keeping up with the demand that they were seeing. So it wasn't a, a catastrophic uh, failure. Their data center didn't lose power or network connectivity completely. Things were up and running, but just not able to handle the, the volume that, that was coming up. Um, in other cases, you'll see you know, a, a continuous period of downtime where it, it is likely something more catastrophic. But clearly, this is, this is not the type of situation you want to see any time, especially um, during you know, the, the peak holiday shopping time. Um, and then the other aspect that, that we looked at for this one, and, and this, is, this is actually a relatively new phenomenon, is there's um, both the immediate impact of you know, your site not being available, but now uh, whenever these things happen, it spills over into the whole social media realm. Um, so we, we did a little bit of research looking into um, what people were discussing on Twitter during this, this day-long period, and um, it, it definitely has a, a big impact. Um, you can see just some examples here. I mean, everything from somebody that's, that's you know, taking a relatively Humorously saying, you know, ask Santa for some more servers. Down to you know, people that are, are are you know seriously you know upset about this that, that may have some long-term repercussions. And the the power of all these social media um, interactions to spread and, and really impact your brand is is substantial. Just with these um, these ten tweets that, that we've highlighted here, um, these people have a, a collection of over fifty thousand followers. So this this you know this. Uh, information gets spread very quickly and very very broadly. So it, it's all the more reason to make sure that um, you do everything that you can to make sure your site stays up and is available and, and responding you know, as, as well as it can be. So um, we have uh, a lot more details on this uh, on our website, and, and we can be happy to share more information on these. But this is you know, just to give you a sense of, of what types of, of challenges are out there in the e-commerce space and, and really why it's so important to make sure that, that you're your site is prepared for things like the, the holiday shopping season. Great. Thank you, Jason. Mm -hmm. um, I'd now like to invite uh, Ron uh, to discuss the dynamically scalable e-commerce. Thank you, Jerome. Appreciate it. Okay, um, so first I'd like to talk about Gigaspaces and some of the key value propositions that we provide to the retail industry. Um, the first is uh, the future proof your business uh, in an ever-growing vertical. So what do we mean by this? Well, basically what we've noticed is that in a lot of retail comp companies, uh, specifically with their e-commerce systems or even their point of sale systems, their existing uh, applications are, are very siloed. Uh, they perhaps are you know, 10 or 15 years old, they're on an older architecture, and one of the challenges for moving forward with these companies are that they are sort of locked into either one way of doing things, uh, one packaged application, um, or an, an older architecture that's very inflexible and, and creates difficulty in adding functionality and providing added value to, to their customers. So what we would like to be able to do in the val one of the key value propositions that we provide to Gigaspaces is really not to lock you in, is to allow you to basically uh, grow your business um, without having to be dependent on you know, a, a, certain, a certain architecture or, or a certain um, package. The next piece, and this is really what Jason was speaking of, is bulletproof reliability. So regardless of the peaks that are occurring, whether that means a scheduled peak such as a back to school season or a Black Friday, or maybe there's a wildly successful marketing campaign, we want to ensure that your business continues to operate. 
and, and we want to do that in, in a highly performant manner. So not only uh, is your system available, but the level of performance and responsiveness to your end customers is, is maintained. And in doing this, we definitely don't want to break the bank. We want to ensure that the total cost of ownership is uh, drastically reduced uh, versus a traditional legacy architecture. Uh, so the value you, you get here is that we will not only provide a software infrastructure that increases your total cost of ownership, but will also allow you to maximize your existing hardware resources so that you're not having to over-provision for hardware, you're not having to over-provision for databases in order to maintain your level of reliability and performance to your end users. And lastly, and this sort of goes to the future-proof your business, we want to allow for faster time to market. So no longer are yearly releases or even uh, every six-month release is good enough. We would like to be able to offer you the ability to continuously release capabilities and functionality in order to better serve your customers. So um, increasing the, the time to market is a key a value proposition that we provide with our solution. And in doing this, we really are addressing five core uh, enterprise application challenges. The one that we mentioned before is peak loads. Uh, how do we handle these peak loads uh, that are scheduled and non-scheduled? How do we do it to ensure that the, uh, the continuity of the business is maintained, there's no downtime, uh, and not only is, it, is the system available, but it's highly performant. So uh, you know, in the past, maybe five, six, seven seconds was an acceptable response time. But now that systems are getting faster, bandwidth is getting larger, users are really requiring um, you know, sub two second response time for their transactions. So in order to do this, we, we need to make sure that the system is very highly performing and optimizing the resources. Well, and again, we also want to do this in, in a way that's very cost effective. So total cost of ownership really should be uh, um, very, very low with, with regard to the, the value that the system is providing. The other thing I want to introduce here is real-time business insights. So one thing that we're noticing, and Jason sort of touched on this when he talked about uh, social media and the impact that it's having as far as reviews for sites, but also we would like to be able to um, be able to understand how we interact with our customers. And, and in order to do that, information is key. So what we want to provide is the ability to not have to go to a data warehousing solution and wait. Um, even a few days in order to get reports to determine how to modify the business, we'd like to modify the, the interaction with the customer in real time based on what's currently occurring. So whether that means real-time rules execution, whether that means complex event processing, those types of capabilities are what we want to offer um, to, to our uh, retail customers. So how do we do that? First, um, I would like to do, introduce our product called uh, XAP, or Extreme Application Platform. Uh, now, just to be clear, we, we offer a software solution. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a container, it's a software container. So it's not a hardware solution, it's not a device that sits on your network, it is software. And here's how our software, Gigaspace software, meets these challenges. Um, and I'm going to go through, and what I'd like to do is, is sort of go through a, a typical tier-based architecture, because I think most people are very familiar with the tier-based architecture. Um, they've been around for the last you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, and there's, there's some challenges inherent in these tier-based architectures. So what I'd like to do is walk through sort of how we would transform a typical tier-based architecture into what we call a space-based architecture that will allow us to meet all of these uh, enterprise challenges that we, that we introduced. So the first thing that we've noticed when going into existing systems is um, one of the key contributors to the degradation of performance, and in a lot of cases, the actual downtime of the system, is the system's reliability on disk I.O., uh, specifically interacting with the database. So typically systems are or interacting with the data, database on almost every transaction that, are used, that an end user makes with the system. So that requires a read from the database, write to the database, update, update to the database. And what, what companies are doing is they're, they're, they're spending a lot of money on the hardware that runs these databases. They're spending a lot of money on very sophisticated database software technologies in order to keep up with the demand. Well, we have a different approach. Our approach is to actually uh, put the database in the background. 
Um, so basically what we do is we take the, the data that's typically stored in a database and we partition that data uh, in memory across our compute grid. Okay, so this is just your commodity software, uh, excuse me, commodity hardware that you have will actually partition the data uh, across that, that hardware. Uh, we will then put the database uh, in the background. Now, that doesn't necessarily eliminate the database. A lot of folks, they want to have a database back there, whether it's a relational database or uh, a NoSQL database. They want to have that database in the background to, to store the information, and that's fine. So what we provide is the ability for an end user to transact with the system all in memory, and then we will uh, guarantee uh, transactionally the update of that information to the database in an asynchronous manner. So if you think about it, the, the latency that's involved with an end user transaction is really just going to the going to the, uh, the going to the in memory data, updating that, and then control is passed back to the user. And then we will guarantee, based on your rules that you define, the persistence of that information to the backing uh, database. So that's sort of where we started out in Gigaspaces 12 years ago when we first started to address enterprise performance challenges was, okay, let's remove the uh, disk I.O. from the transactional equation for the end user. And so performance just shot through the roof. What we noticed then was the ability to actually start, start to do some very interesting um, types of, of compute patterns. The one is the ability to now uh, have messaging be co-located with the data. So now we're actually able to react to state changes of the data. So we're able to create model-driven architectures. We're able to uh, create event-driven architectures so that we can monitor the data as it's, as it's uh, changing or updating in real time. And based on that, we're able to actually uh, create our, our messaging flows uh, associated with that data. So in, in this scenario, we're actually able to take the messaging and reduce that tier so we no longer have a messaging tier. We're actually able to co-locate that with the data. So what you get right away is, one, improved performance, because it's not a separate tier. You're having to do a network hop or anything like that. And also, by reducing that tier, you have reduced your total cost of ownership. Because if you think about it, each one of these tiers, in a lot of cases, it has its own life cycle. You have to go through. You have to, have to do an analysis of what you need in that tier. You have to do evaluations of the products. You have to uh, design and develop to those product architectures. You have to then um, you know, implement and, and roll out into production, monitor, maintain uh, the full life cycle of those products. And typically, those products have different architectures. So you're, you're having to really train up different teams in order to understand your web tier, your business logic tier, your messaging tier, and your data tier. Well, since Gigaspaces is all one product with one common architecture, you really just have one, one way of doing um, all of these capabilities throughout the life cycle of the Gigaspaces, uh, Gigaspaces product. So, so that's one way of how you know, reducing that uh, total cost of ownership comes into play when we eliminate uh, the messaging tier in this case. And you're going to see the other tiers start collapsing also. So the next piece is we're actually now able to uh, co-locate our business logic. And our business logic can be written in just plain Java. .NET, um, or C++. So we can actually take all three of those languages and run those, host those, inside of our application container, co-located with the data. So if you think about the, the latency path for a transaction, obviously that uh, latency goes, goes down tremendously, and performance is, is very high because you're transacting there co-located with the data. So again, improves performance. Again, we've reduced another tier, so we've reduced the total cost of ownership because, again, in one product, you're able to handle your data, your messaging, and your business logic written in Java, C++, and .NET. And now we introduce the ability to get these real-time business insights. So now instead of looking at a messaging tier, looking at a data tier, looking at a business logic tier, and trying to sort of uh, correlate all this information together, you have it all in one place. So you're actually able to see what's happening in your system end to end, all in one place, and make decisions uh, based on that. Either automatic decisions that you uh, decided and you created rules for, or you're able to send out alert, or you're able to have real-time reports in, in order to be able to, to uh, the process what's going on with, with your user base. So 
when I was first introduced to this in-memory model, my first concern was obviously uh, availability. What, you know, what happens if the, the machine goes down? What happens to uh, all this stuff in memory? It just goes away, right? Well, we actually have thought about that. And when we created this uh, initial model 12 years ago, we came up with uh, a replication technology that's, that's transactional, it's guaranteed, in order to ensure high availability. So what this means is that now the, the latency path for a user transaction is updating a primary, which is the primary node that has the, the data in memory, and then uh, synchronously and transactionally updating a secondary, okay, which is obviously going to be on another machine. It could be even in another data center. Um, and then control passes it to the user. Again, there's no disk I.O. Uh, everything is in memory. You have introduced a network hop to ensure your high availability. But the performance is still very, very high because we, we we're not in contention with any uh, disk I.O. with regard to accessing the database. And so you're able to actually define rules to, to say, well, I want to have one, one backup or two backups. I want these backups to be on this machine or that machine. And Gigaspaces will actually maintain those rules or, or those service level agreements that will ensure that the, the capability and reliability and availability of your system is maintained based on how you want it to be maintained. And this is not actually for the uh, entire system as, as one. I mean, so you can basically, in a fine-grained manner, you can define different um, availability rules for different components of your system. So there could be some components that are very, very uh, important that you want to have incredibly high availability. There can be zero downtime. You have a certain rule. Others, let's say it's a uh, backing reporting type functionality, you may have different rules that have has a less uh, level of, of availability or um, service level agreement. In any case, uh, the flexibility is up to you on, on how you want to do this. Uh, I'll actually say that we have several customers out there who in the past two years have had zero downtime. And that's not to say they haven't had uh, failures in their system. Okay, they, they have hardware failures, hard drives go bad, uh, you know, CPUs go out, motherboards die, and all that, and that's fine, and, and that happens. Uh, but we're able to actually uh, basically uh, recover from that. So we're ab able to actually in ensure that our availability system will uh, move the processing and the data around and put it on other machines transparently, transparently to the user. So the user sees no downtime, and the machines can be swapped in and out um, on the fly, hot, hot swapping without any impact to the end user. Again, this is obviously a key in ensuring business continuity. The next piece is, and we haven't forgotten about the, the front end UI portion, we're actually able to take a standard JEE WAR file and host that in our container. So uh, any standard WAR file, WAR file, let's say that you were running in, in, in a WebLogic or in a Tomcat, you're actually able to take that WAR file, host it inside of of Gigaspaces, and, and again, inside of the same container that we've been talking about, and have that co-located with the data. Uh, now, you're not required to have it co-located with the data. That's an option. So you could have your web tier that has a local cache, a local view of information that's just required for the front end. And then that web tier could be communicating with uh, the business logic that's, that perhaps is co-located or maybe is not co-located with the data. So the flexibility based on the components of your system is, is very high. So you can define that some components need to be co-located with the data uh, because they're very data intensive. You could say that other components are very compute intensive. So I actually want to uh, basically farm out uh, a request to my compute resources to process information for me and then give me a result. Those patterns are supported out of the box with, with Gigaspaces. Again, as we see, this uh, obviously improves performance. Uh, continuity is another uh, plus here because you, you have reduced another tier. So not only is your total cost of ownership uh, reduced, but since you have a since you don't have another tier that you have to maintain, um, the chances of things going wrong are reduced. So there, there are few moving parts in the architecture. Okay? Since again, this is one arch this is one product, one container. Uh, you, you don't have all these different uh, disparate architectures with different patch releases and, and different functionality and different ways of maintaining and monitoring. You, you don't have those sort of all cobbled together. So you're able to actually have this one, um, one architecture that's supporting 
all your, your business logic functionality, your messaging, your data, and your web, um, your, your web functionality all in one container. And I mentioned before the ability to scale on demand. Uh, and this slide says auto scale the entire application on demand. And, and that is true, but it's even more than that. It's the ability to define each individual component of your application or each individual service to define that one service scales one way, another service scales another way. And Gigaspaces is able to actually enforce those scaling rules or those service level agreements to ensure that you're able to provide the level of performance low latency and availability to your end users uh, in a very optimized manner to, and taking advantage of the underlying uh, resources um, that you have available. And just a, well, another word on that, um, and I won't get into the SLAs too much in this talk, but I'm more than, more than happy to talk about it uh, offline with anyone who's interested, is you're at, actually able to define these rules based on uh, really anything you can think of. So in a lot of cases, customers will say, well, once memory gets to a certain level, or once the number of requests come in get to a certain level, or once the number of threads get in to a certain level, or a combination of all these, then I am in a, quote, scale event. And if I'm in a scale event, perhaps a marketing campaign was just successful, or, or now we're starting up Cyber Monday, or whatever it may be, then Gigaspaces is going to automatically provision new resources, and it's going to automatically deploy new uh, components or new instances of components onto your resources in order to handle that increased load. And then, and, all, and as important, once that scale event has dissipated, once you're no longer in that situation where you need those resources, we're, we release those so that we're, we play very friendly in a multi-tenant environment. Um, so you don't have to dedicate a huge you know, data center worth of, of hardware uh, for your system. You're actually able to um, have gigaspaces expand out elastically and contract elastically based on rules that you define um, and w rules that help you provide the level of customization and service to your uh, end users. So hopefully, um, I've, I've sort of touched on the tip, tip of the iceberg a bit on how uh, Gigaspaces solves these uh, these five challenges that we that we focused on: the peak loads and performance, uh, continuity, and real-time business insights, all while reducing your total cost of ownership. So that's the key: um, not to invest, you know, huge amounts of, of money and resources and hardware and time and effort into each one of these tiers but to really have one application platform that allows you to uh, you know, address all of these end-to-end uh, -end, uh, needs. So, so that's great in concept. Let, let's talk about a real real life case. So I want to take you through a, a case study of, of a large retail customer that we've worked on here in the US. And I want to talk to you about initially some of the problems and, and, and goals of the system. So the one primary problem of the system of this legacy system was scalability. And like I mentioned before, this customer found that the database was the bottleneck. Uh, they were throwing, um, I, I would dare say, millions of dollars at the database tier uh, in hardware and software costs and, and you know, very expensive replication technologies. Um, and, but they still found the database was, was a consistent bottleneck. And it was very fragile. So they may get the system up and running. It may be very performant uh, in relatively low latency for a while. But then invariably, something would happen. Um, and, and you know, uh, some, uh, some other piece of, uh, of, the, of the tier based architecture would fail, or the database would, would lock up, and, and they were down. Uh, and any, any amount of downtime for, for this retail customer costs significant dollars. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned before, this is a good classic case of application silos. So they had a silo for their e-commerce system, a silo for their point of sale in-store system. Um, they were creating a, yet a new silo for their mobile system. And, um, and so all these silos you know, had their issues because they were all different architectures. Uh, there was no way really to share a user experience or share information across uh, these tiers at all. Uh, and there was, of course, no sharing of services. So uh, one tier may uh, transact a, a certain use case one way, and another tier would, would transact it in a different way. So there was no continuity at all. Also, th this system was, was very dependent on the mainframe. Uh, so they started out as a, as a mainframe shop, and, and they still had a, a high dependency on the mainframe. 
And the concern was uh, the mainframe MIPS uh, cost that was, that was occurring in the system. And so they, they really wanted to release that. Uh, they also had an issue with visibility. And visibility meaning that they really didn't know what the system, not only what, what the system was doing from a technical standpoint, but they really didn't understand you know, kind of how their users were using the system. And it was very difficult to get information out of the system. Uh, I, again, attributable to the fact that the architectures were vastly different, so information was stored in different ways, and they were very siloed, so there was not a lot of sharing of information. Uh, and last, but definitely not least, is they were getting passed by their competitors. So their competitors were actually able to release um, you know, new functionality uh, a lot quicker than, than, this, than this customer was. Um, and as a matter of fact, they only had major releases once a year, minor releases every six months. And so it was by far uh, not enough and not agile enough to compete, especially with the, the new social media and, and, and the new uh, era of responsiveness that customers and customization and personalization that customers ex uh, expect. And so this was a challenge. So, so what do we do? Well, first of all, like I mentioned before, first thing we did was get the database out of the transactional path. So we took the data that was typically used in their online system, and we partitioned that and put it in our data grid. Uh, in doing this, we helped streamline the architecture. So we're able to collapse down uh, a lot of the business functionality and messaging into one container so that it's very streamlined. Uh, by doing this, we're also actually able to have shared services. So we're able to actually open up this architecture uh, and the, the capabilities of, of these services to the other silos of the system. Um, we're able to uh, basically take the mainframe and, similar to the database, put that to the, in the back and optimize the access to the mainframe. So uh, instead of hitting the mainframe for every transaction, we're able to actually batch up the transactions and, and push those to the mainframe in, in, in sort of a real-time batch mode and when MIPS were not as expensive. So we definitely reduced the MIPS uh, expenditure. Uh, the other thing, it, we talked about visibility. We, we architected the system for not only real-time insights, but also big data analysis. So not only were we able to provide real-time access to what's going on right now in the system, and actually by, by using business rules co-located with the data and complex event processing, so we're able to actually uh, correlate events that are occurring in the system in real time, we're able to actually persist that information to a big data store for um, further analysis that would allow this customer or this retail company to provide even more customized marketing campaigns, more customized programs to help, uh, help drive their business. And uh, last but not least, uh, continuous release cycle. So, uh, if you look at the development of, of business logic using gigaspaces, again, it, it's not using some special architecture or some special API. It's just plain Java. Uh, we use Spring to inject our functionality, so the impact to Java code is very, very minimal. Um, and so the, the users can really focus on their business logic. Since we can dynamically load and reload business logic, you're able to actually do this without bringing the system down so the system stays up. You're actually able to introduce new functionality. And uh, with regard to the data model, you're actually able to make modifications to the data model uh, in real time and to update that. So if, if your business logic is dependent on different or new data structures, we're actually able to uh, accomplish that without bringing down the system, thus providing the ability to uh, reliably uh, and, and keeping high availability in mind uh, load new business logic uh, in, in real time. So the, the you're able to actually take an agile development process and turn that into not only agile development, but also deployment, uh, monitoring management, all the way through um, through the back-end data center. Excuse me. Okay, now that all sounds great, and you know, um, and and you know, they were very interested, but there was a lot of concerns. Um, uh, this company has has been in business for uh, you know many years, and again they were a very siloed environment, so they were very concerned about the expertise to design and implement such a system. It was a really big paradigm shift, right, to take folks from either a mainframe uh, mindset or a packaged app mindset and move them over to you know this architecture. So the way we were able to address that was one, you know. We've been doing this with a number of retail companies and, and quite frankly, a number of, of companies across multiple industries. We've actually cut our teeth on the financial services industry, um, which has very, very demanding requirements. And, and so you know, we, we were able to bring in our architecture expertise 
and, and mentor the team in order to uh, come up with a plan to create a transitional architecture that would uh, al allow them to not suffer the, the business downtime. That, that was another big concern of them of theirs. So in a combination of, of Gigaspace's architecture expertise and our partners, who are both design and implementation partners, we're able to uh, bring to this customer the, the expertise in order to make this happen. So I mentioned downtime. So you know this cus this customer uh, has has a large large business. Um, it's almost like taking a race car going you know, 100 miles per hour down the road and changing the tires without pulling over for a pit stop. And that's what we needed to do. So we need to actually uh, look at the system, figure out you know where we can actually make modifications, the impact of those modifications, and how we can reduce the impact. And and then obviously you know provide the level of high availability and performance for those new components that we're introducing into the system. So it definitely was not a big bang approach. A lot of times those are in some ways easier from a design perspective. But what we had to do is really design a transitional architecture and a roadmap to move the customer from their existing system over to a new system. Uh, the last piece was vendor lock-in. Uh, this this uh, company has has been burnt by vendor lock-in quite a bit in the past, and they didn't want to make the same mistake again. And so what we're able to do is show them that, again, we're just plain Java or C++ or .NET or a combination of all three. Uh, we're not locking you into a standard, uh, excuse me, we're not locking you into some proprietary API or proprietary framework or, or proprietary GUI. Uh, it, it's, it's really very, very open. Um, the, the capability we bring to bear is really in the, in the runtime, monitoring, management, deployment uh, area to give you all the illity that you expect in an enterprise application. But your your investment in codifying your intellectual property is in standards-based languages. So, for example, for Java, uh, we provide a JMS and a JPA and a JDBC interface, so that users aren't having to learn some some strange uh, language that they've never heard of before. Uh, and so, the vendor lock-in argument was very quickly, um, I guess, addressed. And we're able to to help them in, ensure that they can move to uh, another platform that they would like to in the future. Okay, so how did this first look? Well, uh, I, I'll I'll just talk about a few of the silos. There there are actually many more at, at this customer side, but some of the ones we touched uh, initially were one is the e-commerce packaged applications. This was the one that was really causing the the big problems uh, with the system. So the e-commerce uh, system was was having some issues. It was um, the, the package itself was, was not very performant. It was accessing the database basically on every every interaction with the user, and that was an issue. Um, they, for the last couple of years, they were developing their own sort of mobile uh, front end to this uh, package app, and you, you see the the technology stack here. So they had JBoss, uh, Spring. Uh, they used Hibernate for their mapping, and they used EH Cache to cache the data. Um, but again, this was interfacing. Again, this was still another silo. It was interfacing with the web. It was talking to uh, the database, even though you had the data cached. It still wasn't um, as performant as they needed to be, and it was definitely not open. It was not a shared services model, and that's really where they wanted to go. They not only, they they wanted everything. They wanted performance, low latency, high availability, shared services, real time business insights, and you know that that architecture really wasn't going to provide it. Um, and then also the point of sale system was was talking to the mainframe again. Um, high NIPS cost. It was a, it was a big concern, and, and obviously no sharing of services here. And um, they also had an issue where they were running out of their batch window. So their batch window uh, couldn't expand any, but the processing that was needed in batch was growing and growing. So in several cases, they were actually running out of their window, and they had to shut their batch down. And so that was a big concern. So that that's that's what we had to address. And functionally, here's what we did. We, we basically came in and we said, okay, let's look at that e-com package app. Let's take some of the key components that are causing problems and actually let's move those into uh, our container. And so the good thing was this e-com app was, was written in Java, and so it was fairly easy to, to take the functionality that it was, it was utilizing and, and basically rehost that functionality inside of our container. So there's where you see the e-com processes go inside of, go inside of Gigaspaces. We're actually able to take the entire mobile application and, with very minor changes, move that directly into our web container. So we're actually able to take that JBoss is actually a WAR file running in JBoss. We're actually able to take that and host that in our embedded Jetty container uh, and scale that uh, there co-located with the business logic. So that was a, a fairly simple matter. 
The great thing here, though, now is now the mobile application shares the same processes and the same data grid capability as the e-com. Um, we also were able to introduce uh, the point of sale system as far as interacting with, with processes um, in our container. So we didn't completely eliminate the mainframe, and that'll take years and years to do, but we're actually able to offload uh, a lot of the functionality that was, was hitting the mainframe on every request to the data grid uh, and, and actually uh, and to those shared services uh, so that the MIPS uh, cost on the, on the mainframe was reduced uh, tremendously. That, and now once we had all this together, uh, what we're able to do then is actually create uh, business rules associated with what's going on in the data grid. So, and these rules now span across the mobile, e-com, and, and point of sale. So you're actually able to run campaigns a lot more efficiently uh, and a lot more customized to the end user by having these business rules there co-located with the data um, and running those, you know, sort of in real time as, as things are transacting. Uh, the next piece we're able to do is actually uh, has this real-time batch. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the fact that we can scale up and down based on, uh, you know, user load and demand. Well, we're actually also able to take advantage of a lull in demand by creating um, or spawning real-time batch uh, processes that are able to actually do these, these batch when there's, there's a lull uh, in processing and there's available uh, compute resources. So we're able to do that and we're able to push information to the mainframe. We're able to uh, push the appropriate information off to a NoSQL database. In this case, it was Cassandra. Um, so we're able to take this information, push it to Cassandra so we can do more uh, big data analysis uh, in near real time um, uh, across the information that's coming through the system. So, so how does that look as far as, you know, how does that scale? Well, um, what we were able to do is, uh, you know, we keep our, our hardware load balancer that, you know, we're not really getting in and, and addressing the network architecture in, 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 our, um, in our use case. So for, for our tablets and, and mobile devices and web devices, everything comes through as normal. We go through a, a HTTP load balancer, which, by the way, we interface with in order to register and deregister web containers. We're able to, uh, to scale the web tier up and down using our container. Uh, we're able to then uh, call uh, our, our shared services or our process, and again, written in Java, C++, and .NET. And, and then we're able to asynchronously, as you see by the dot or the dash lines, asynchronously persist this information to the backing store. Backing store could be the database, could be the mainframe, could be Cassandra, could be any other type of persistence. This is actually an open interface, so you can write anything you'd like um, to, to persist this information to any other type of, um, of, of storage. Uh, and again, this is all run and, and dependent on the rules that you define. So the scalable inelastic uh, memory and processing grid is driven by the rules that you define uh, to, to say, how do I want to scale? How do I want to scale these processes up and down? So, uh, so that's, the, that's what we did for this customer. Uh, again, it's, a, it's still a work in progress. Uh, we've, we've provided some tremendous value. We future-proofed their business. Um, so now they can see how they can you know, focus on their intellectual property written in Java, C++, or .NET, not having to worry about, you know, am I going to be able to modify in the future? Am I going to get locked in? We've given them the ability to have this bulletproof reliability. Uh, they actually talked to several of our references who have been up for many years uh, with our software without any downtime um, as a result of our software, and our software has actually been able to um, deal with the hardware problems and the, and the other like database problems underneath the hood. Uh, underneath the system uh, without having that manifest itself in front to the uh, end user. Um, and the uh, substantial cost reductions, again, we, we got rid of, you know, a lot of, a lot of tiers here. Um, we're, able to add, we're able to not have to uh, devote so much uh, time and effort and resources into the database tier with regard to hardware and software costs and maintenance costs because now it's just a backing storage. It's not part of the transactional path. And uh, by, by being able to do real-time uh, deployments of not only the, the business logic code, but also data changes, uh, time to market is very, very quick. So it's almost a continuous release cycle. I believe they're releasing once every couple of weeks now. But they could really release in a continuous manner, but they have their own internal QA process they need to go through, which is great. And, and so, but, but what they've done is drastically increase their responsiveness, responsiveness to their market uh, the ability to address uh, things happening in real time, the insight to know what's happening in real time, uh, and then the ability to actually uh, act on that, either in an automated fashion or at least having the business intelligence to know 
you know, what they need to do as far as uh, addressing the, the market needs. So that's, uh, that's it for my piece. I believe uh, that's the end of it. Well, yep, we have a thank you here. And, okay. But if there are any questions. Great. Thank you very yep. much, Ron. Thank you. And thank you, Jason. Uh, we'd not, now like to address some of the questions that arose during the webinar. Um, so the first one, uh, I, I believe it's for you, Ron. Uh, we have applications spread across multiple data centers. How do you handle this scenario? Oh, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, so I mentioned we had this replication technology. And, and that's really in the context when I mentioned it of in a data center or maybe a, a data center with another data center that's fairly closely located. So, um, and, and that's a great scenario. Uh, and we have a lot of customers who are replicating from one data center to another. But then once you get to uh, regionally or geographically uh, um, separate data centers, it's a, it's a larger challenge. We actually have technology. It's called our WAN replication technology that allows us to uh, reliably and transactionally replicate data around the world. So we have customers who are actually taking uh, data that's in London, replicating that to London, replicating that to Hong Kong uh, in a highly efficient, highly reliable, and transactional way. So that's actually uh, a use case that's definitely in our sweet spot, and it's something that um, that uh, you know we'd love to to talk to. Um, anyone who's, who's more interested in that. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, Jason, I think this one's for you. Um, how did uh, the 2011 holiday season compare with the 2010 uh, as far as flight behavior? Uh, the, the, the main thing that we saw, I mean, obviously the, the volumes uh, continue to grow over year, but the, the main thing that we saw by looking at the response times uh, across all the sites that we monitored was that the the peaks um, for the the holiday season are spreading out a little bit more. Um, so for 2010, there were very sharp peaks on uh, you know on, on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Um, now we're seeing for this year uh, that there were you know smaller peaks on actually Thanksgiving Day, uh, some of the day before Thanksgiving, and then uh, you know some other points uh, throughout the. The, the season, and then another one, uh, I think, on the 23rd of December, which is the last day to, to really order anything shipped in the U.S. So um, the, what it means is that it, you know, there's, it, not that the, the peaks are getting any lower, but that there's more of those, and there's more uh, places where people are, are hitting your site, you know, whether it's you know, from their, their computer or sitting on the couch you know, watching you know, football on Thanksgiving and, and shopping online. So you really have to make sure that you're, you're prepared for all that, that season. Uh, great. Um, I guess this is a, a joint uh, question. Um, were any of GigaSafe's clients uh, amongst those that performed well in the last holiday season? Uh, yeah, actually, take this. The, uh, the 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 sample uh, or the case study that, that Ron was talking about is is actually one of the uh, the sites that we've monitored, and, and they've done uh, really well. They for both the 2010 and 2011. Um, uh, seasons they've had you know, no downtime at all, so every every uh, request that we made came back successfully. Um, and, and also, in terms of looking at the the response times, they were in the the top ten uh, across all the sites for both years. So uh, the site stayed up; it's it's responded quickly, and then you know from from everything we've seen has has worked great. Yeah, I would add that uh, this this customer was on the was on the the naughty list, if you will, in two thousand nine. <laughs> prior to us getting involved, and now they're on the NICE list in 2010 and 11. Yep. Uh, okay, one last question. Um, does uh, Digit Space is supporting the cloud platforms, and uh, if so, what type? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, yeah, so actually on my uh, diagram that I uh, failed to mention uh, is that we are, we do support actually all cloud platforms. So. The exact same system, the exact same architecture that, that we talked about here, uh, you can actually take that and transparently move it to not only any cloud environment, but any virtualized environment or any just uh, bare OS environment. So we've abstracted out the interface to the underlying resources and what we call the cloud driver. And that cloud driver can talk to your hypervisor environment to request resources. It can talk to your cloud environment to request resources and you know uh, give back resources. 
Um, and also using our, our agent technology, we're actually able to do the exact same thing on just the bare OS without any type of virtualization or any type of you know, cloud capability. So the great thing about that is that you can actually run in a hybrid environment. So you could actually run in your local data center in a hypervisor environment or, or maybe private cloud. Um, you could even, based on rules, uh, based on load, you could actually do cloud bursting up to uh, an, over to another private or to a public uh, cloud infrastructure using the exact same implementation, exact same code. So again, this is another no lock-in, future-proofing capability that was, was very, very interesting to this customer and others, uh, not only in retail but in other industries. Great. Thank you very much to both of our panelists and to our attendees. Um, this, the recording of this webinar will be available on the Gigaspaces YouTube TV channel. Um, and uh, you can also uh, surf to www.gigaspaces slash e-commerce to see more information on this topic. Have a, have a good day. Thank you all.